Now, actually, a, an idea came to mind while you were speaking uh, at the end, you know, which I want to share with you. I, I, and it, it may not be worth anything, but I, it, uh, when you started talking about this eminent person's group, and you, you really do have a very, very distinguished body, I wonder if it might be possible in some fashion to create some kind of an eminent young people's group, students. Uh, and the idea, with, this relates also to what we were talking about uh, yesterday. Do you have a, a recording a machine between John and I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because of this, oh, you, this is this is something that we talk about. So you are, okay. Yeah. <laughs> a great line, as they, as they say. Okay. We were talking about social media and the like. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you know this might resonate, and it would. Uh, there, there have been many great, many eminent persons groups. But I'm not really aware of many groups of young people who focus on this issue. So if, if John and you are already uh, going down that route, I uh, you know, applaud the effort. Um, it just came to me just a few moments ago, so I, I felt obliged to share with you my uh, perspective on the matter. Uh, Bill, if I may uh, answer this. In fact, my uh, initial idea after one of the science and technology conference where we brought uh, uh, people, I mean, kids from the international school. Uh, they were, you know, from all uh, uh, geographically wide as distributed as possible. And then they were, you know, singing, peace, and talking. And then uh, I was uh, elected, but not in function yet. And then I said to myself, why if I had a group of young students or kids mixed from all over the world? And then I get funding to get them to move around and then speak out the importance of the answering to force of the street. That was my initial idea. But you see, I said to myself, if I do that, it's not easy to convince people that they should spend money on guys who don't have experience to talk about a treaty that is so complicated already, okay? Then I turn into uh, having eminent personal experience because what happened? You'll find out that the people will listen to Bill Potter because they know that he's running this center and then he has experience in arms control, bomb proliferation and disarmament. They will listen to Andrew when he goes back to State Department because he said, no, I'm coming from the James Martin Center for Disarmament and whatever. <laughs> they will listen to you the same way. But if I say I'm coming from uh, Honolulu, no, I didn't want to say Honolulu, but let's say <laughs> Vanuatu, okay? Uh, and then they will say, okay, and I'm talking about disarmament and non-profession. Uh, the first thing they'll do, they'll check if there was a, there's a school there uh, for design and not for information. If not, then they won't listen to me. So this is it. That's why we wanted experienced people in that field that could help us. But yesterday, uh, you heard Bill saying that I started by talking about a 16-year-old <coughs> kid who came to me and who is basically uh, simulating the Senate, the U.S. Senate, and in ratifying the CTBT. He's 16 years old. Okay? But he's passionate about this treaty. And he's coming and talking to me. So I told him, come and be an intern the next summer. Okay? Why? Because I'm so impressed to see somebody at 16 who is devoting time for this cause that many people before me and us today and people after us will still work and then may not find a solution. But he's preparing the seeds for something that is so huge for us to achieve. And that's why Bill is right. When I see this 16 year old kid, maybe you guys here, as you simulate the NPT, you can put the seed for advocating for the CTBT and then link up to the group of eminent person and then take this idea further because you come from so various countries and so forth. Maybe next time, you will not only run and simulate the NPT, you will simulate the executive council of the CTBT. And this is what you should do for us. If you do that, you'll do good to us, you'll do good to the international community. Because people tend to forget about this executive council. They, they tend to forget about this treaty that is not yet into force. So if you start small, we'll build big together. And then we'll link you up, 
And I'm sure you'll be proud to sit next to uh, Secretary Perry and then him sharing his experience with you. You know, Secretary Schultz is 94. I was sitting next to him at his right the whole day from 8.15 in the morning until nearly 10 o'clock in the evening after dinner. He didn't doze a second, <laughs> okay? He was up, he get up, get his coffee, comes, and then he listen, and then when he intervene, he knows exactly what he's talking about. And I'm sure you all want to do that, to do that one day. So guess what? People are asking me, but Asina, you were sitting next to him. What was he drinking? What was he eating? <laughs> so that we do the same. <laughs> okay? So I wish and I want you to one day sit next to people like him. Because I'll share something with you. I'm where I am today because there's something that I've been told. To listen to people, to elderly people, listen to their experience. But you do that, there's something you need. The love of people around you. Not only your parents, but everyone around you. So here what you should do to succeed is to share tolerance and love. And that's what will help you to move forward. So I'm asking you to follow what Bill said, to take the CTBT issue among you, and then maybe you develop already the seeds for the youngsters advocating for CTBT, and then we'll link you up to the group of eminent person, and we'll find money for it. And I can tell you, we'll have money for it. Thank you, let's see. Thank you. Questions, Dan? Question from, from anybody here. Sarah, maybe with, when I call upon you, if you could uh, mention who you are, uh, where you were from and what country you're representing, if in fact you're part of the simulation exercise. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> I My thought the simulation was finished. <laughs> 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 so you, you, what you do, you tell your name of the simulation and then you tell, you tell me your real country. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, well in the simulation I am from Russia and my name is Sarah and in real life I'm from the United States. Um, and I was hoping, I know that this is a very broad question, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges of getting the CTBT ratified by Iran and Israel, because I know that that's a particularly challenging dynamic, and I was just hoping to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Look, uh, I'm sure you found out that I'm uh, uh, a little bit too optimistic uh, since I started talking. I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, so look, if you don't, let me tell you why I think I'm optimistic. Look, um, I visited China, I visited Israel, you know, I'm in the United States. Uh, I visited Egypt before, and I'm intending to visit Iran, and I say that I wouldn't mind visiting North Korea if that could help them to sign the treaty. But I can tell you, it's all about what we've shared just now how you convince people that the money they're investing in this organization serves their purpose, okay? This is all what it is about. You talk about Israel. Look, if I ask you the question, what do you think could be the problem in that region? Because there is, you know, they can't, uh, we can't have the summit on the nuclear weapon free zone. Okay, there are issues, there are tensions. And then people are talk, talking about gap in coverage. Is the international monitoring system as effective in this region as in others? Mm -hmm. What we have to do is to not listen only to one country, is to listen to all of them. Okay? Because issues in that region are the same issues in Israel, in Iran, in Egypt, in Jordan, and whatever. They all have the same issue. How to make sure that in this region, we trust each other. As to make, how to make sure that this verification system, if I bring the issue back to the CTBT, can help that purpose, help building trust in the region. So what we have to do is to make sure the coverage is excellent, is make sure the information that we give doesn't bring confusion from one country to another. Okay, and make sure that the deliverable of the international monitoring system and the international data center is trustworthy. That when we make an analysis or we provide technical specs to country, they're confident enough to make their own decision. 
and they're confident that this organization is bringing nothing but something that is internationally legitimate and internationally useful to everybody. This is my role as head of the CTB team, as head of a system to verify compliance with this treaty that is important in this region. If you do that, you build trust. Okay? In building trust, you create the condition for them to say, hey guys, we have something to gain in this treaty. And this is why and how I'm hopeful that, if you recall, after my visit there, the foreign minister said that the ratification of the CTBT by Israel is not if, but when. Let's hope that this when is not too long. If this when is not too long, it helped create the condition in that region for Egypt to consider ratification, for Iran to consider ratification. Because don't forget, people can say what they want, because Egypt, Iran, Israel, they all participate in the work of the CTBT. And Iran has a certified station from the international monitoring system. People shouldn't forget that. The station might not be providing data today, but it's the station that was certified. If the station was certified, it means that the station was judged that meeting the technical specification of the international monitoring system and providing data to the IDC. So what we have to do is to create the condition of trust to the station to come back. And I think in working together, we can achieve this. Okay, And I'm hopeful that the condition will come at some point for the trust necessary for those countries to ratify. But in your question, we talk about the eight countries. Have you asked yourself why, in the end, they brought Syria to sign the Chemical Weapon Convention and to dismantle the chemical weapon, and then they didn't consider the CTBT? It's a weapon of mass destruction. One can argue that because Syria is not among the eight remaining countries, but the signature and ratification of Syria could help create the condition of trust in this region. And this is once again why I'm saying we have to make sure the relevance of the CTBT is everywhere. Even if we don't think it's necessary, we have to bring it. Because a tiny bit can serve the purpose of the trust building that we want to achieve. And this is what we're doing to get this region to ratify. And this is what we're doing here in the United States. I'm not doing anything. I'm not coming and asking the Senate to do so. I'm telling them, hey, guys, you're spending a lot of money, and then you have a good return in investment. And Under Secretary Rose Gottmuller is doing an excellent work in advocating for this treaty. She's doing a lot in the educational process to help the civil society, for people, wherever they are, to talk to their senators to understand that this treaty there's something to gain with it. And then you should all do the same. If you're from a country that has not ratified, I count on you to help us share this message. Thank you, Mr. Uh, okay, let's uh, first uh, we'll have South Africa, then Ireland, and then we'll reach out to others as well, please. Um, good afternoon and welcome, and thank you so much for your time. Um, it is awesome. It's rare to speak to someone who's so learned, who still has so much optimism, and that's inspiring. And thank you so much, Bob. Have I mentioned who you are? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, my name is Bailey. I'm a native of California, and my colleague Ruby and I represent South Africa. Um, my question has to do with information sharing, particularly with the IAEA. Um, you mentioned that it wasn't until Fukushima that it started to become an issue of you have this incredible international monitoring system with these these uh, capabilities. And I was interested to know how that um, exchange of information strengthens the IAEA's uh, verification procedures, if it does. Um, and if not, what are the challenges in, in kind of taking the data you have and applying it in a non-proliferation context? Look, that's a, it's an excellent point. It's a point that we're talking exactly right now. In fact, last week I was talking to uh, Amano, the Director General of the IAEA Advice. Uh, let me step back and then say one thing. You see, if you work for the CTBT, you work seven years, okay? You might get an extension of two, three years, and then you're there, and then you get a job at the IE. Okay, what you learn at the CTBT, if you're a scientist, because that's how scientists are, they have their pet project, okay? They take their pet project wherever they go, 
Okay? When they move to the IEA, they want to do the exact same thing they did at the CTBT, but not giving the impression this is what they're working on. Even if they give them another task, they turn to return back to the pet project because whatever they are, they want to make it relevant. Same as I want to make the CTBT relevant everywhere. Okay? They do the same. So where that brings us? It brings us to a situation where sometimes we duplicate effort. You talk about sharing information. Why on earth the IEA should care about seismic monitoring? They shouldn't because we do it for them. But you'll find that they have the seismic monitoring section. And why should the taxpayer pay twice? They shouldn't. Why? But why they shouldn't? Because we need policy makers like you. When you come as delegates in your different constituency to make sure there's no duplication among the international organization because it's the same money that you pay. That whatever the CTBT does can serve the purpose of the IEA and vice versa. So that we don't pay twice what we can pay once. And you talk about Fukushima. It took us 45 minutes to decide that we could share information between the CTBT and the IEA, something we didn't do since 1998. Okay? But should the world always wait for a catastrophe to act? Of course not. But what happens is often uh, we don't step back and look at the broader picture. You will be a delegate for the State Department in uh, Vienna working at the mission one day. But in your mission, you'll have two dealing with, three dealing with the IEA, one and a half dealing with CTBT. And then when they come back, you have coffee, but you don't talk about your experience at the CTBT to those who are coming from the IEA. So by not talking about it, you might be pursuing something at the CTBT that your colleague are pursuing at the IEA. And if you guys don't share, I mean, you duplicate effort. And this is my experience of the international environment, which you don't do in the private industry, by the way. Okay? So this is where I think there's room for improvement. We have to make sure we force the international organization to share experience, share information in the interest of the international community for taxpayers to not pay twice because it's expensive. So that's one way of being cost effective. And I agree with you, yes, Fukushima was an opportunity for us to provide data to the IEA. But not only the IEA, we provided WHO, we provided to the FAO, and then we're now part of YACANE, which, I mean, the acronym may be too complicated, but it's uh, a consortium on uh, radiological monitoring and whatever, where the CTBT is part. But you see, what you say is interesting, why? Because at some point, people said that the information from the CTBT is confidential. Okay? But sharing knowledge, i tell you something. When I joined 10 years ago, there was a task leader on confidentiality, meaning our information should remain focused for this. And then it took us two and a half years to negotiate the agreement with uh, UNESCO IOC. Then we start opening. Then they say, okay. Then we had our science and technology conference. We wanted people to use our data and then improve our system. And then people say, no, we must give them only historical data from our virtual data center. If I ask you, what is historical? You still young, you will say historical is 10 years ago. Okay? Uh, Secretary Schultz will say historical is 100 years ago. <laughs> okay? Somebody younger than you will say historical is next last week. Okay? And somebody even younger will say historical is yesterday. And then you get closer and then you'll say historical is today. And it's 10 minutes ago, 5 seconds ago. And this is where we have to move the concept of historical to allow people to use the information because there's nothing to hide. As long as the information serves the purpose of what we want to achieve, which is making sure we have a trustworthy system that people know they can tap onto for their own purpose and then for the purpose of the international community. Thanks, Peter. Okay. As English representative of Ireland, and then we'll turn to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you, Dr. Zerbo. My name is Adam, I represent Ireland, and I'm also from the United States. And my question is, uh, for the last question, you said that why should the world wait for a catastrophe to happen before we should act? And you mentioned historical processes. 
And my question is about urgency. So many people in my generation have known mostly peace for most of their lives. And we tend to forget uh, the historical events that have um, brought about the MPT, brought about the CTBT. And so the question is, how do we reignite that sense of urgency, especially in young people who haven't really experienced those kinds of events before? It's a question we had yesterday. By your generation, use social media. Okay? Good start. Okay. That's a good start. <laughs> you see, I was, uh, I'm even better in social media than uh, in terms of <laughs> 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 We were having lunch today, and then I told him, uh, have you ever used Viber? Personally, no. He didn't even know what it was. But I know it because my young daughters, they call me using Viber because they can't pay for their phone. So they, they ask me to register in Viber, and then they call me, and then it's so handy. And then uh, now we send texts, but I said, you know, maybe, no, I left my phone there all the way, I would have texts now. No, by the time, no, they're sleeping now, so I wouldn't have texts. <laughs> but you see, Facebook and whatever social media you have, you should use it to make sure you talk about what you haven't known, that you heard of, and that you can share with people to understand the danger of the use of nuclear weapon. And link that to nuclear testing. And I said it in the beginning, if you talk only about nuclear testing, people don't see the value, don't see where you come from. But if you show and you visit Hiroshima, and that's one thing as well that uh, Bill Porter should be thankful, uh, he was in the advisory group of the SG and then they put together this disarmament fellowship and then they take them around and then they take them in Hiroshima, uh, Nagasaki, uh, everywhere to see the consequences of the use of a nuclear weapon. Okay? When people see that I've been to Hiroshima, I've talked to, I think, one of the last survivors of Hiroshima. He's an old man. In fact, I have a photo of him. It's, it's an amazing. He was sitting and telling me how, as a little boy, he survived. Okay? And he, he told me about people he saw walking, walking, and then, you know, the flesh was out, falling from their, you know, their body, and then so forth. He was telling me how bad it was. I don't know it. My generation doesn't know what nuclear explosion is about, that the bomb is about. But when you see it, you make sure it doesn't happen again. Not for you, but not even to your kids and your grandkids. You make sure you prepare the ground for a world that is safe and secure. But yesterday, I mean, there's a different school. Somebody was saying, no, we shouldn't be talking and then making uh, a situation where our kids will fear this world of today. We should talk about the beauty of the world, rather. And then how good it is to make sure the world remain as beautiful as it is today. So we had a mixed discussion yesterday about where to start with. But I still believe if people understand the danger, it's like a kid. When you know you have your little some of you have kids, you know, he see he sees fire, he's get close, he says, Oh, you know, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. You tell him, no, 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 not that. He goes, when you're not looking, he comes back to the fire again. Until he's burned his finger and then he knows this is fire, he doesn't come. So maybe that's one way of uh, teaching people <coughs> the danger. That's why probably human nature, and that's one, one of the uh, high officials of one uh, big country told me that this is human nature. Until something bad happens, we don't think about it. So your generation should make sure that we don't wait for something bad to happen before we start thinking about it. You have to anticipate. You may, we, uh, we may have a, a discussion tomorrow as well, but uh, one of my colleagues, Masako Toki, who's in uh, the room here, heads a, a program which focuses on high school students, the Critical Issues Forum. And we are, in fact, planning to have uh, the next meeting of high school teachers and students from around the world uh, in Hiroshima. And so the idea here, I think, is to really raise the visibility of this issue for young people uh, around the world to see firsthand the consequences of, of nuclear weapons use. So that also kind of addresses your question, but it's, it's a very good question. Uh, distinguished Dr. Uh, my, is that the sequence right? I think it's Iran's turn next. Yes. Um, my name is Scott, and I am 
representing the Islamic Republic of Iran, along with these two distinguished people on either side of me. Um, I'm originally from the United States, though. Uh, in fact, I, if I could just interrupt here, I mean, a, a little, I would say the majority of uh, the simulation uh, is from uh, outside of the United States. We are, have a disproportionate representative of U.S. speakers, so I would encourage some of our distinguished colleagues from other countries also to take the opportunity to ask a question. But, I apologize for the interruption, sir. On that point, my uh, colleague on my left is from South Africa, and the colleague on my right is from Bolivia, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good step. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to kind of go back to, to the data sharing. Um, yeah. you, wanted, you said that you wanted the uh, CTBT wanted to ensure that the data from the CTBT wasn't used by one country or a group of countries to indict another. Um, is it? Is that a significant problem, or is that a, is that a significant barrier to some of the eight states that still need to ratify? No, I, look, the, the problem is the following. Each of those states receive the information from the CTPT, okay? But what I, I'll take you, when, when we do an analysis, uh, what we have to do we have to give an area that is normally a thousand square kilometer. This is what we say that we should conduct an on-site inspection. Okay, but if you take a thousand square kilometer in the Middle East, <coughs> it's not a thousand square kilometer. I mean, the concept and the perception is not the same here and on here because within the thousand square kilometer, you have many countries that fit into it. Okay, because they're so close to each other. You take Israel, it's very small, you get to Egypt, you get to Jordan, and whatever. So it's something we bring the 1,000, I'm just taking uh, an hypothesis, okay? We have the 1,000 square kilometer, and within that 1,000 square kilometer, you have different countries that fit into it. One problem could be, <laughs> where do you lay out the exact pinpoint of this? Because you have to conduct an on-site inspection. I'm just trying to simulate the, the situation that is coming. So we have to fine tune our processing and analysis to a point where we can be as precise as possible. Already, with 90% completed, we are more precise than what was anticipated in the treaty negotiation. So if we complete this system fully, if we enhance our processing capability, we will give more confidence to those countries with regard to the problem that I'm laying out here. And this is what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's less about the information from one country to another. It's more about the information that we provide, the technical spec that we provide to be precise enough for them to be able to say, yes, the same information we got proved that this event is here rather than there. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our colleague in the back row. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Rohan. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I represent uh, Egypt, and I am from India. Um, being from India and knowing the situation in the subcontinent, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Me and my brother is from the other side of the border here. <laughs> so, I believe my 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 true question is. In, in the presence of such lack of trust and where weapons of mass destruction are looked at as items of national pride, how do we educate? This is something I personally saw in 1998 mm -hmm. when the explosion happened when there were celebrations on the streets rather than fear. Something I've dealt with constantly when I went back home. How do we help? Any advice on helping change that would be very, very greatly appreciated. Thank you. No, I mean, excellent point. And I'm glad that. Uh, as somebody from India, you're asking this question. The only problem I had, I thought in 1998, you were uh, one year old. <laughs> you look so young. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Okay, look, uh, yes, you said the word, national pride. Mm -hmm. Okay, you talk about India. Yesterday I was telling a story about uh, a minister from a tiny little country from my part of the world who came and visited me in Vienna and then said, hey, you know, why not? We should also develop nuclear weapons. And he said, no, because how I many if you have it, people respect you. Okay? This is 
you know, I was in Japan talking to young students, and then they asked me the same question. Why we should let North Korea, you know, doing tests and then showing flexing muscles, and then we sit and watch them and so forth. But I mean, you say that in the 98, 1998 tests, you know, people were on the streets, you know, happy and excited about it and so forth. Have you imagined a world where all your neighbors do the same? and everyone has a nuclear weapon, and then you still care for your kids, for your grandkids? If everyone has it, can you imagine we're all sitting in this room? If there's one gun, it's still better than if all of us has guns, because you don't know who first takes it out, and if he takes, what are the consequences? What we have to do is to make sure, if there are already five guns, we have to make sure we deal with those five guns, and then we don't allow others to have more guns or we don't allow more guns to enter the room. Because if there are 20, we're in a more difficult position to deal with them than if there are five. The reason why I'm saying this, you're right. When I go in the developing world, people tell me, ah, it was as bad as in, 90, no, in 2008, I was briefing ambassadors in the African Union in Addis Ababa, and then one told me, you know, very strongly, he said, Dr. Zerbo, why are you working for this uh, apartheid organization whereby some are allowed to have nuclear weapons and then some aren't? It goes with what you're saying, okay? But the reality is, is exactly what I'm saying. If five have, let's do with the five and let's allow other guns to get in. And this is the issue here. It's true. We might feel that those who have, have more strength. But let's try and deal with a situation where we don't allow more to have, and then we'll deal with those who have and see how they can reduce. And this is the biggest problem that people talk about, the Zabama non-proliferation and so forth. I'm not in that thinking. I'm trying to be practical. What is the reality? The reality is the gun that I'm talking about. Let's deal with five. Let's make sure no more gun gets into the room, and then we'll be able to save the situation and deal with five. So this is why I don't see it Past generation may see it as a sentiment of pride, but not anymore. And I can tell you, my generation in Burkina Faso, when we were at primary school, uh, I used to be, how you call this in English, because I'm from a French-speaking country, the head of the class. But I was the smallest, even if I look much bigger today. You know, <laughs> I was the smallest, and then I used to be happy to go around, and then when people were not uh, listening, because when the teacher goes out, he tells me to take care of the class. So I take my finger and then I, I say, hey, you didn't do well. And I'm small and the guy is bigger. He's waiting for me at the hand at 5 o'clock and, you know, he hit me on my head. <laughs> okay? But you don't have that anymore. And people talk more instead of fighting. And this is the world that we should look up to. You see what I mean? We should talk. There's no room for this type. I mean, there's dialogue is possible everywhere. And in that dialogue, I want you when you leave this center of non-proliferation, to go back to India and help those who were chanting on the road, uh, you know, on the road for the 1998, mm -hmm. to tell them we're living in a different world today, and share what you've seen today, the message of peace that you heard here, and then what you want to see, how you want to see the world tomorrow. If you do that, you will have done a lot for what you've learned here. You've done a lot for us. You've done a lot for you for your kids, and then for the international community. Thanks. Thank you. It's so interesting. We, we may have a, a number of Pakistani mm -hmm. students in the class. And look to my right, and I see our Russian and Ukrainian colleagues seated uh, next to one another. Not too many places in the yeah. world today where yeah. you find that. <laughs> uh, there is some, some hope here. Other quest questions? Uh, let me, uh, please. Uh, this is a problem. Uh, I'm also representing Ireland, and originally I'm from Pakistan. Uh, my friend Mr. Rohan rightly pointed out. I also observed those street celebrations in Pakistan in 1998. And uh, what I believe that uh, it's a time when we need to change perceptions. And the perceptions can only be changed through education. And what we need to do is to promote disarmament and CTBTO related, CTBTO related education. And CTBTO is doing well in that context. Uh, I don't want to ask the question, I just request uh, what are your observations uh, regarding the recent public policy course that you launched 
in Guyana about the CDBTO, that how it, it, it has affected the young minds and the future diplomats. Are they really willing to contribute towards this cause? Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, you talk about the public policy course, and thanks to Jean's uh, commitment and dedication to, you know, educating. And this is what I'm, I'm saying. I was talking about pet project. Uh, Jean left here, so he was trying to carry the same because he, he missed uh, Monterey. He couldn't bring the bay in Vienna, <laughs> but he, he wanted to make sure he continues the same thing, education and training. And it's true. The public policy course uh, is uh, a lot of, of the success story of the CTBT. Why? Because, uh, you know, same as here, we have people from India, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, you know, all the eight remaining, no, not all the eight, because we still have to bring North Korea. Uh, that will be in John's performance appraisal for next time. <laughs> uh, so the challenge is for him to bring somebody from North Korea to the next policy course. So we'll actually return to North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so if he doesn't, there will be no course next year. First, <laughs> first you have to go there. Yeah, so, <laughs> so look, uh, it gives us the opportunity to bring people uh, that traditionally we don't manage to bring around the same table, at least in that field of arm control and disarmament, uh, to talk. And you talk about education. It's a way to bring them to share knowledge. I think we had Indian uh, fellow there. Uh, they were inviting me to come. No, it's India or Pakistan, I think. Pakistan. It's Pakistan inviting me to come to one of the courses. I think we haven't managed to get that. But you see, we have also, when I was talking about linkage between the group of eminent persons, Germany is funding somebody to go to India and Pakistan to talk about CTBT. Why? If we don't have a relationship with India and Pakistan, it doesn't stop those who have relation, even if it's trade, industry, or whatever, to go there and then talk about the relevance of the CTBT by using a different channel. And you will be able to do the same because you're here today, you're talking to many people, you're hearing somebody from the CTBT is coming from nowhere and talking about the importance of this treaty. And then when you go back, you will talk about it. Okay? And I hope that I've given you a little bit of message that you can take. Just if I didn't, then please tell me, and then I will probably go back to Burkina and do farming. <laughs> you know what that's happening. Uh, distinguished representative from Canada. I am Michael Dutzman. I am originally from the United States. I am representing Canada for the simulation. Um, given all the problems that we're having right now, do you think that the CTB team might be possibly used either to initiate discussion on further ratifications at the upcoming review conference or even using it as almost a uniting factor among the non-weapon states at the review conference? Excellent. Sean will tell you at the uh, preparatory meeting for the review conference, I was there, and it was exactly at the time where we were uh, talking about the possibility of North Korea carrying the fourth test. But mind you, the conference opened, no one talked about North Korea, no one talked about CTBT. Or if they did, it was North Korea, they didn't mention CTBT. Because people forget that the CTBT is the only international framework that dealt with nuclear test explosion. But I talk about IEA, uranium enrichment, is it a plutonium bomb or a uranium bomb or whatever. But before you even talk about plutonium origin or uranium origin, I mean, you have to talk about you know, making sure that this test doesn't happen in the first place. So you talk about the next uh, PREPCOM, the NPT PREPCOM. I wish and I hope the simulation that you guys have, you will put the seed for people to keep the relevance of the linkage between the CTBT and the NPT. That will help the cause of the CTBT because people sometimes come at the NPT review conference, they don't even hear about CTBT. Some hardly know what CTBT is all about because people uh, as we often say, we are victim of our own success. I mean, people say, okay, you're able to detect, you have a verification system that works, you have an international monitoring system that is functional. So why aren't they into force? So you might go back and then be in the United States delegation. Make sure in the proceedings and whatever, there's a positive word for the, towards the entry into force of the CTBT. You do go to the street. And it's valid to all of us. When you are in your delegation, make sure what you learn here 
gets the whole process to look at the bigger picture, not to only focus about writing something on the NPT and forgetting that the CTBT is somewhat linked to it. You will help the cause of the CTBT. You will help me, and then you will help the international community. Maybe we set a precedent. When we, when we travel to New York on April 27th, and I'm sure a number of people in the room will be there, maybe we'll see the first speaker at the review conference be the uh, executive secretary from the CTB team. <laughs> 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 to pass that along. Uh, I think I saw the distinguished representative from France, and then we'll turn uh, to South Africa. Who had to know which one of you wishes to speak? Both. Okay. <laughs> but I think we have different questions. Hello, Mr. Executive Secretary Zerba. Thank you very much for visiting us and letting me learn from you. It's an honor to have you here. My name is Marina. I am uh, representing France with my colleague Sean. And originally, I'm from Armenia and Belarus. And my question is. Both. Yes. Both. Oh, okay. My roots are from Armenia. I was born and raised in Russia and Belarus. Okay. Um, my question is, obviously we are interesting, uh, interested in uh, joining uh, as many countries as possible in CTPP. Now, inside of CTPP, how will you uh, make uh, meet the interests of antagonistic states? For example, like India and Pakistan, maybe somehow China and USA. How to make their interests meet inside of the organization so they will both join it? Okay. Okay, right now it's easy to deal with uh, US and China because they've signed a treaty and then we can, as I told you, uh, try to work towards uh, creating the condition of trust. And to that effect, uh, you must have heard that uh, uh, one of the first things I've achieved as Executive Secretary was to get China uh, to transmit data to the International Data Center, something that China wasn't doing for the past 10 years. Uh, why? Uh, due to the fact that uh, I had personal excellent relation with China, and then China has been participating in the work of the CTBT, uh, you know, intensively, extensively, and then seriously. And uh, we've built the trust condition between China and the organization, and then we've uh, helped China to move along with building their set of international monitoring stations in China's territory. So we work towards convincing them to transmit data, and this is effective now. And indeed, the US was very happy. The international community was very happy. And Iran was curious to see that China is transmitting data. And Egypt was asking me, we didn't know that you could build a station and then decide on the transmission later. So that's, those are the type of condition of trust that I'm talking about, okay? To bring those two together. But if we do that, China is transmitting data, Iran is considering the fact that China is transmitting. There are negotiations right now in the 5 plus 1 talk, which I hope will be fruitful. And that might be condition of trust to consider uh, transmitting data from Iran and creating the condition from India and Pakistan to consider even building that to be the terminal station that you will see in our international monitoring framework. and then to create those conditions that will bring those two together to sit and talk. Mm -hmm. The easiest way would have been to bring all eight countries in one room, switch off the lights, <laughs> <laughs> and then give them papers, and then hope that at the end, when you bring back the light, they will hold sign and write a book. <laughs> That's another dream that I'm allowing myself, but I haven't had that dream yet. <laughs> okay? I haven't had that dream yet, so maybe you have it, but I hope <laughs> if you wake up tomorrow and then you have it, tell me, and then we'll, we'll make that a reality. So this is basically to tell you that we're doing our best on a daily basis to create those conditions. It's not easy, but we are hopeful. But in being hopeful, we shouldn't be naive of the reality that those countries have, the domestic issue that they have to deal with. We should help them to create the condition for the trust that we want to create ourselves. You talk about China, US, you talk about India, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, Iran, and the DPRK. But what I can say, if we have China and US ratifying the treaty, because if you take under NPT the five nuclear weapon countries, those are the two that have signed but not ratified the treaty. Russia has, France has, and UK has. If 
those two join, I think already we've done a huge, huge, huge step. Because one uh, foreign minister told me that small step from China to transmit data, it's a small step from a big country. So a small step from the big country is a huge step for the international community. You should keep that in mind. I see our distinguished representative from uh, South Africa. Uh, I'm tempted to say the distinguished representative from Scotland, since she just uh, studied at St. Andrews University uh, in Scotland, and who knows what the, the polling results are. <laughs> Maybe in, in a future <laughs> review conference we'll have a, a, an additional party. But uh, So were you voting a couple hours ago? <laughs> <laughs> you still can't decide. <laughs> um, I'm Ruby, and I'm representing the South African delegation. And I actually had a question quite similar. Um, there seems to be this consensus that if the U.S. ratifies the rest of the countries will follow suit, especially in the case of China. But I was just wondering if you really thought that would be the case with countries outside the NPT, such as North Korea and Israel and India and Pakistan, whether you thought those conditions of trust really would transfer over. I think it would be a step. But to be honest, I don't like uh, this idea of domino effects, OK? Uh, because we have to respect the sovereignty of each of those eight countries. They know why they don't want. I would want to trust them in their own reason and work myself within the organization to create the condition of trust. Not to link the trust to necessarily if the US does, all the eight will do. Okay? I mean, if you sitting in the room and then somebody say, oh, if Andrew does something, I will do it. I mean, you don't necessarily want to follow Andrew. You want to have your own reason and to make up your own mind and then to make your own decision. But nevertheless, I think. As I said, if those two had joined the CTBT in terms of ratification, I think there would have been a, a huge step already in the trust building, in the confidence building within the, the eight remaining. I think we will take uh, two more questions. Sean, did you also have a question earlier? Yeah. Why don't we take three? Oh, we have, okay. We'll take four <laughs> questions, uh, one after the other, and then I'll, I'll uh, let the Executive Secretary respond to any portions of those four questions uh, that he would like to. So, uh, why don't we start, sir? Well, my name is Isham. I'm from Pakistan, and I'm uh, representing uh, China, along with my colleague from uh, Pakistan. Um, although I totally agree with you um, about uh, eradication the ratification process. Just for the sake of discussion, I just uh, wanted to put the question to you that um, why do you think that only a few countries uh, should have uh, possession of the weapons of mass destruction and the rest shouldn't? I ask this question because uh, I belong to a society where uh, we previously, uh, every citizen was armed and post 9-11 after the war, there, uh, the laws changed and uh, now specific sections of society have weapons. Uh, I've seen a direct increase of exploitation as a result of that. So do you think that kind of exploitation or anything like that could play into the non proliferation regime in the same sense or not? Thank you. I'm going to collect the, the four questions and then uh, if you can try to keep track. Um, the distinguished representative formally of South Africa, uh, Tom. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zerbo. Uh, Tom Gray um, from the U.S. by Worcester Representative of South Africa. My question, we've been talking last a lot. Year. Uh, yes, last right. year. We've been talking a lot about um, entry into force. I've read the opinion several times now that uh, some people say that it doesn't matter if it enters into force, that uh, aside from on-site inspections, that the capabilities of the CTB, PTO, preparatory committee are so good uh, that even if it never enters into force, that the normative standard will be such so, so strong that it doesn't really matter. I was just curious to get your opinion of that. Thank you, Tom. Distinguished so, Representative of Japan. Um, hi, my name is Shirley. Um, uh, we are me and my colleague here are the, um, representing the Japanese delegation. And I'm just interested. And you're originally from? Uh, I'm originally from China, sorry. And then uh, I'm just interested in the Chinese issue, of course, personally. And uh, some of the parts of my question is might be already have been covered, but I'm really interested in the Chinese perspective. Just like, are there any potential beneficial outcome will be brought to China if we ratify the um, CTBT, even if U.S. doesn't ratify it? That's the second question. Thank you. And I think last for the purposes of our uh, conversation today, we'll turn again to uh, the delegation of France. 
Dr. Zerber, thank you again. The most, or uh, the least philosophical question of the day. Could you identify yourself? Sean, I'm, my name is Sean Krikorian. Uh, I'm from the United States. Um, the least philosophical question. Which of the annexed two countries do you think is next to ratify? <laughs> okay. okay, that's a, an interesting collection of <laughs> questions for you to address, okay. Mr. Executive Secretary. I'll start by that one, uh, because I answered this question already uh, uh, from, uh, uh, it was surprising, my answer was surprising, because people say, which of the next, and then I say Israel. Okay? You see, you all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so your reaction uh, pushes me to say it's either you react like that because you think I'm crazy, <laughs> okay, or you react like that because uh, uh, you probably felt this would be the last country to to ratify. But I tell you why. Uh, I've mentioned being optimistic, but not being naive. Okay, uh, when we started the discussion, we start by the condition in the Middle East and how we can build trust. You remember I was drawing this thing. In fact, I drew the same thing for the foreign minister and the minister of intelligence in Israel when we were talking. Okay, we were, I mean, everybody thought we'd spend five to ten minutes. I think uh, I spent probably 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay because the discussion was interesting. It started, you know, as usual, like in a, a boxing field, there's a tension in the beginning, and then you measure, and then you see whether you should run, and then your, uh, the guy who is hitting you follows you, and then he never gets you, or, you know, you should talk. And we talk, we talk, and then I'm convinced that where the international monitoring system the International Data Center and the on-site inspection capability are today, we can deal with the issues that are of concern in that region. Issues that belong to Israel, issues that belong to Egypt, and potentially Iran to a certain extent. And this is why I think that Israel will gain after seeing that we can deal with this issue in the ratification of the CTBT, because they will gain a lot in what's happening internationally. And that's why I believe that they could be the next one to ratify. And I still believe in it. I believe in it to a point where what you don't know, we have the integrated field exercise in Jordan. We have three countries that were uh, interested in organizing the IFE 14. It was Hungary, Ukraine, and Jordan. We had already a build-up exercise in Hungary. The decision was between Jordan and Ukraine. When we choose Jordan, people say, oh, you guys are crazy. There's the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring, we don't know what would happen in Jordan. But did we know what would happen in uh, Ukraine? No. And we choose in Ukraine today, uh, the IFE 14 was in jeopardy. So the reason why I'm saying this is because no one can predict what happened tomorrow. And this is why there is room for hope. If somebody has told you that Syria will be in this situation today and they will sign the chemical weapon convention and then will dismantle the chemical weapon in Syria, none of you would have been able to predict this. So none of us can predict what happened tomorrow. And it's because of this that we have to be hopeful and pray God that it creates the, it help us create the condition of trust for ratification. And this is why I believe that Israel could be the next one. Now, the benefit for China. So I'm starting by the reverse order because you know my brain works that whole way anyway. <laughs> uh, the benefit for China. We discussed this when I was there with the foreigners. It's true. Uh, China, and then this is China is seen as waiting for the United States to ratify before they do. Although some argue that the day they will go, China will probably put it to one hour before the United States does. <laughs> they just want to make sure that they are on the way, and then uh, probably the ratification is on the desk already. I mean, this is the anecdote. But anyway, look, uh, one argument is 
you know, why wait for the United States? This is my point. China is showing today an economical leadership. You know, economically, China is strong. Why don't you translate that leadership economically into political leadership? In doing so, you will help the current administration to deal with their own domestic issue because you would have helped the condition of trust that maybe they need here in the United States to consider the CTBT ratification. If this is if we talk about you know why urgency from one side and not another. I think in this global world, I don't think there is room for testing from a decent country in this 21st century. Since 1992, since this 21st century, we talk about one. One exceptional country. No one else has tested. Can you see anyone testing in Nevada today with all the green uh, political you know, institution and whatever is happening? There's no room for testing. There's no room for testing. Can you see France testing with all what's happening today? Can you see UK testing? I think they care about keeping together with Scotland today. That's an urgency. <laughs> and we'll wait for the result of the vote. Okay? I think there are many other issues to deal with today than doing <coughs> nuclear testing. Because there's no room for testing, we should consider now why are we not ratifying? Why are we not getting the CTBT into force? I think this is my answer to your question. So now, uh, why aren't we into force if things are working? I think I've answered this question already because I see we are a victim of our own success. It's true. Many people ask us, okay, we have the data. We, if anybody tried to cheat, we can detect with your information. Why aren't we into force? We need entry into force because if you don't have entry into force, the risk is that people can resume testing. You need that legally binding framework that is the entry into force of the CTBT. It's only way that will stop anyone from going back to this era of arms race and resume testing. This is why entry into force is necessary. And this is why even if we successful, even if we can tell our success story, the job is not finished until the treaty is ratified, until the treaty is into force. So now the first question, uh, if uh, because I'm getting old now, I don't know if I recall, but I think it was uh, why only few country. Uh, that's the question from Pakistan. <coughs> from Pakistan, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Why only few countries? I think we've uh, touched that question as well. Uh, it's what I was saying. Uh, I brought it back to, you know, this example of uh, if there were five guns in this room, uh, I mean, that's how I can take it. And then you will say, you know, why Andrew, John, uh, and those five here have guns, and why not you? And then we all locked in this room. Okay, you say, no, we need more guns in the room. And, but at that time, we talk about leadership. Bill and I, are chairing the meeting today. Our job is to make sure there's no more gun. We deal with those five first. Okay? It's the same thing. Okay? There was a fact during this treaty negotiation. It was acknowledged that those five had it already. Okay? What we do, we want to have a world that is safe and secure. Let's make sure there's no more. It has nothing to do with whether we discriminate one against another. It's a factual thing. There were five that had and that we know. We have to make sure no one else gets another gun into the room. We deal with those five. We deal with uh, uh, making sure that no gun enters. And then we start negotiating with those five to say, hey, guys, you know, we all want peace in this room. We don't want to hear gunshots. OK? This is exactly what is happening in the NPT and the CTBT and all those treaties. So I want to put it that in that simple way for you to not take me in that political thing because I remember that I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we've also discovered is that he's a, a marvelous instructor, a marvelous professor. And I want to remind you that there is life actually after the CTPT as well. So <laughs> we have a number of very distinguished uh, diplomats in residence historically here. And we would 
Welcome your return, uh, uh, Dr. Zerbo. Please join me in thanking Dr. Zerbo for an exceptionally rich uh, discussion.